So first of all, I wanted to thank and thank and welcome our new members to the, to the XAB. Um, you're going to be on the wrong end of a fire hose for the next couple of hours, um, and you might take a little time to recover. Um, we have uh, we started doing this orientation for our new uh, members uh, earlier this year, and, and uh, they, the, the members found it very helpful to get introduced to the project and and uh, and everything that goes on. It's a as you'll find a very uh, large and complex set of interactions that are going on. Um, we think we have it pretty well in hand and we, we review well, uh, but that doesn't make it easy to explain everything that's going on. Uh, so we are going to uh, make our best attempt to uh, concisely, and if you call two hours concise, concisely relate uh, at least um, uh, the major efforts and activities uh, around the project um, and what's going on. You, if you've been um, a user of Exceed Services, you're going to see a lot of stuff that you probably haven't seen before because um, you know, you're only seeing sort of the the end user facing side of things and not uh, the inside of the project and how it runs and a lot of the things that happen on in the background uh, that allow us to be uh, to allow us to deliver a lot of these services to the community. So um, uh, actually, uh, what I I know that I'm gonna get in trouble from Le for Le from Leslie on this already, but uh, I'll do it anyway. Um, I, I think it might be helpful uh, if the folks on the call very briefly introduce themselves because we have some new folks here um, and not everybody knows each other as a result. So um, I'll start with myself. So my name is John Towns. I'm at the University of Illinois um, at the NCSA, the National Center for Supercomputing Applications. Uh, and my hat today is, is the, the principal in investigator for Exceed. Um, why don't we uh, go through the... Um, the XAB members uh, next, and uh, let's see. I'm trying to bring up the list here. How about Elizabeth? Yeah, Elizabeth, you've got the list in front of you. Elizabeth, can you introduce yourself? Yeah, sorry, I was looking for the unmute. Um, so I'm Elizabeth Cherry. Uh, I'm a new member, uh, and lots of new things going on right now. This is actually my first day uh, at Georgia Tech. I just moved here to computational science and engineering. Welcome. Uh, let's see who's, uh, Le uh, who's next on the list. Leah? Yeah, hi, um, I'm Leah, sorry. Sorry. Uh, Leah no worries, it, everyone pronounces it that way. Um, I'm Leah Ben-David um, at Vassar College, um, and uh, I'll be starting my fifth year there. And uh, I do theoretical chemistry. Welcome. Uh, Peter? If you can find his unmute button. Okay. Can you hear me okay? Yep, gotcha. Yeah, I'm on my phone. I won't have a proper workstation for another 10 minutes or so. But um, this is Peter Kovaris. I work at Caltech with a LIGO laboratory uh, and manage data analysis computing for LIGO and chair the uh, LSC, LIGO Scientific Collaborations Computing and Software Committee. Um, and I'm actually, uh, through co for complicated reasons, I'm at Georgia Tech every other week or so. So uh, maybe there's an opportunity for us to sit down and have some coffee. <laughs> oh, there you go. Uh, let's see. So Tom, maybe you can introduce yourself next. Yeah, I just, hi, I'm Tom. I'm from the University of Utah. I'm a professor of medicinal chemistry. I do biomolecular simulation. I also direct research computing on our campus at the University of Utah. Uh, I've been on XCB for a while. I just thought I'd drop in for a few minutes. I probably won't stay for the whole thing because I've heard it before, but just wanted to put a face or a voice to a name for the, for the new members. Uh, so, um, Leslie, I'm not watching it so close. Do we have, did we have any other XAB members on the line so far? Not, not unless the 512 number is, uh, who's the 512 number that joined? That's me, Kelly. Oh, great. Uh, Hi, Kelly. Yeah. Okay. No, that, those yeah, are the I'll be in the car. Okay. Those are the only XAB members that we have then, John. Okay. I'm going to, I'm going to let, um, the Exceed team members introduce themselves as they give their presentations. Um, uh, cause I'm already behind schedule. Uh, but I wanted to, to at least uh, have uh, the XAB members uh, some time to introduce themselves. <clears throat> okay, so again, my name is John Towns. Um, I'm a PI on this project, and um, if I can get my, into the right window, <clears throat> what I'm going to try and do here in the next uh, 15 or 20 minutes is, is give you the very high-level um, overview for, for Exceed. And, and first and foremost, as we, we develop this project and, and as um, information has become available, 
<clears throat> we have we have worked very hard to remain aligned with uh, NSS planning, and uh, that's become a little bit more challenging of late because <clears throat> many of their strategic plan documents have expired, and they have not uh, posted new ones for us to 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 work from. So we've continued to work with the ones that, that exist, even though they're um, what they call archived as, as far as NSF is concerned. <clears throat> and so you see here, it's the, the overall uh, NSF uh, strategic plan, the cyber infrastructure framework for 21st century, again, an archived document, but it has been guiding a lot of what particularly um, the Office of Advanced Cyber Infrastructure um, has, has been doing. And that's the, um, that is the office out of which this project is funded. Another, um, Office of Advanced Cyber Infrastructure uh, document is this NSF Advanced Computing Infrastructure Vision and Strategic Plan. Again, an expired document, but um, uh, what we have to work from. I, I will say, just because it sounds a little bad, um, there are other things that, that we, of course, uh, try to align with. And this first one on this slide is this, uh, what's called the Blueprint document, which was released a, earlier this year in draft form by uh, Manish Parashar, who's the Office Director for the Office of uh, Advanced Cyber Infrastructure. So this is intended to replace some of those, some of the other documents as, as it um, gets developed further and, and finalized. It is in draft form and they are um, accepting input on that now. <clears throat> uh, also on this slide are a number of other documents that we keep in mind, um, both as things that are coming directly from or for NSF, but also in the broader context, understanding what's going on um, within the, the larger um, uh, ecosystem in which we live. <clears throat> So here are statements of the vision and mission for Exceed. I'll let you read those as I ramble a little bit. Um, uh, we've, we've tried, we developed these a few years ago. We tried to develop uh, statements that we thought would have a, at least a decade long lifetime, even though we developed them in the context of a project with only a five year lifetime. Um, that turned out to be wise for us because now we are in the second five year uh, funding round for, uh, for Exceed from, from NSF. Um, and just so for those that, that are not aware, um, at the, uh, the first of next month will be the start of year uh, nine of 10 years. So we, we've got just a shade over uh, two years remaining in, in the award period. Um, although as time wears on, I have a feeling we may have end up in an extension situation, um, given that um, how long it takes for awards to happen. I'm concerned that a new award will not be in place uh, before the expiration of the current award. So um, as you can see from these statements, um, Exceed is really about increasing productivity and, and, and creating environments that, are, uh, that, that enhance productivity of, of uh, researchers and, uh, and, and scientists of a wide variety of types. Um, and, and also uh, we're trying to develop uh, the, overall, uh, the overall ecosystem and, and uh, as you'll see in various elements of the workforce and, and, and such. Um, we're going to end up talking about a lot of things that aren't what on, what's on the slide uh, because we'll be talking about how this project operates uh, and supports what's on these slides. So these, these are images from a number of, of stories we've released over the last year or thereabouts <clears throat> in science successes that, that um, Exceed has played a role in, in, in enabling. <clears throat> and ultimately, this is what we're, we're all about, is enabling this, this best science. And so this is really a reminder not to lose track of, of that's really what we're, we're after in the end, um, uh, so as not to get completely lost in some of the weeds that we're gonna be traveling through. Uh, Exceed has um, some crisp statements of, of strategic goals, um, and they're stated here. I'm not gonna read them for you. You can read them yourself, um, but they fall under these three broad categories of deepening and extending use, both the existing and future uh, uh, members of the community. Um, advancing the ecosystem by um, both evolving its infrastructure and uh, improving its workforce and sustaining the, ex uh, the ecosystem, maintaining and operating a productive environment um, in which uh, the, the science and engineering research and education community can, can, can operate and, and conduct their work. So um, those are our strategic goals. You'll see they're broken down into the sub goals, um, uh, which are, we are, you, we associate, um, key performance indicators with to measure our progress against these goals. Uh, we'll go into that uh, a bit uh, in, in a later discussion. Um, and, uh, but this is what guides us. It uh, helps us to prioritize our work on an annual basis. Um, it helps us decide things that we should and should not do. Um, and a whole range of, of considerations like that. Um, again, the, the key performance indicators that we use to 
measure progress, help us understand where we may be falling short or um, need to apply some additional attention to improve our progress in various areas. The overall budget for, uh, for this award is $110 million over five years. And what I've done here is provided you a breakdown of how we're investing that $110 million um, against those strategic goals. Um, so you might imagine a considerable amount of it goes into sustaining the ecosystem, operating what we have, but um, uh, perhaps a little surprising, the deepening and extending use uh, really accounts for almost half of our budget. Um, and this is where we provide significant uh, support to the community in a variety of ways. Um, but we also uh, pursue new communities of users and, and bring them into the use of, of these sorts of resources and services. Um, there's a certain amount of effort that, that brings new things into the ecosystem. Um, so we have an investment in that. And then we have something called the Project Improvement Fund, uh, which is um, what most people would consider a contingency fund in, the, uh, in their projects. Uh, NSF doesn't allow you to have contingency funds and awards like ours. So um, we, I don't actually know anybody who's done an award like ours and, and created something like we have here. So it's a bit of an experiment that I think NSF was willing to uh, let us run. And it has allowed us to, to do a variety of things, many of them behind the scenes uh, that improve the project's ability to deliver services and capabilities. Um, and therefore, again, um, enhance the productivity of, of the research community. <clears throat> um, there is a, a rather extensive partnership that, that uh, comprises EXCEED. Um, there are four primary centers that, that, uh, that constitute most of the budget for, for EXCEED. Um, so those four institutions, as you see, NCSA, PSC, TAC, and SDSC, um, but they're complemented um, by another um, 15 institutions and, and participants from those institutions uh, who bring capabilities that didn't exist at those centers um, and, uh, and enhance the overall partnership and, and its ability to deliver on its goals. Um, so uh, as it turns out, some of these have come and gone over the life of the project uh, because, uh, well, lar largely because people are moving between institutions, um, but we've been able to relatively easily handle those sorts of changes uh, of, of changes in partnerships and, and, and who's participating in the project over time. You might imagine something that's as distributed this and touches on so many universities, there's a, a fair amount of turnover in our staff, um, something we, are, we actively try to manage, um, but they all live uh, at one of, one, or more, one of these institutions that you see here. <clears throat> um, so what I'm gonna give you is here a couple of high level views of, of Exceed, and as we go through the presentations of the other uh, leads in, in, in the project, they'll go into more specific er uh, uh, areas of activity. Um, it's often very difficult to uh, describe Exceed in one slide, and this is a one slide version of, of trying to really focus on what are the things that, that uh, what are the principles that, that we operate by. And so you see them here on the, on the right side of the slide. Um, while we have this, this complex set of interdependent efforts, um, we have these, these, these principles by which we have been operating uh, throughout the project. So a focus on the people, which are our most valuable resource. I think many people have come to recognize that the, the resources are important, but the, the folks surrounding them are, are far more important. Um, raising the, the awareness of the value of, what we're, uh, of the sorts of services that we provide to the community. And that's not just exceed, um, but certainly just the, the use of these sorts of things in, in, in research. And it, it's one of the challenges at the same time that we face because just like the power company, if we're doing our job, you probably don't see us too much. Um, expanding uh, effective use of, of, of uh, cyber infrastructure. Um, so we often are reaching out to new disciplines uh, and new institutions to engage folks. Uh, having this persistent, secure, reliable environment for research. Uh, researchers really don't want to be worrying much about that environment in which they're working. They want to simply get their work done in it. And we have worked very hard to provide this, this environment that is stable for them uh, at the same time that it introduces new capabilities, that it's secure, and it's, it's something they can count on. Um, and then uh, uh, finally, accountability and transparency. We have these strategic goals and performance metrics that, that allow us to report on how our, uh, we're progressing. Um, uh, we have extensive reporting that you'll uh, have the joy of, of experiencing. Um, we provide 
uh, essentially quarterly reports to NSF. Uh, we actually have one due next week. So there's been work going on uh, in the last couple of weeks on that. You will uh, have the ability to look through that also um, uh, for further information about what we're doing uh, more current. Uh, today is really more of a higher level overview. Um, uh, let's see. This is another way of looking at what, uh, what Exceed is, is engaged in doing. Um, so, uh, and, and you'll see the point of the slide once we get to the end of it. But uh, so what I've done here is I've, I've collected various services and, and, and resources that are available via Exceed into these different uh, circles here. So you see this, this set of resources and uh, the resources come and go over time, of course. <clears throat> We have a bunch of software that's made use of uh, some software developed by Exceed, but uh, the majority of the software that, that uh, we're making use of, we're integrating uh, from the rest of the community. <clears throat> Networks and, and security are another big part of this. Um, of course, all these resources have to be connected together in a, in a secure way. So we leverage a lot of capabilities out in the community again, and have incorporated them into our environment. <clears throat> There's considerable amount of effort in, in connecting with the community. Um, and uh, we'll hear uh, more about this as, as we go through the presentations. Um, but we have um, both some formal organization, um, organizations and, and connections to the community and then a bunch of informal interactions that we also have uh, with the broader community. So that, that's how we're connecting there. <clears throat> Data, of course, is a, is a, is a major um, issue and a growing issue for many folks in, in, in their research endeavors. There are a number of resources and services that uh, are available via uh, Exceed for that. And then, um, and we have some representatives of these uh, uh, on the call today. Um, we try to connect with these large scale in, uh, instrument and infrastructure projects that MSF is, is, is supporting. Um, and so that, that ties into scientific instruments. The, the relevance of all this is in fact, this is how NSF describes the cyber infrastructure ecosystem uh, with those same categories. So what I've done is I've tried to, to show how what uh, Exceed is doing maps into uh, how NSF views uh, the, the broader cyber infra infrastructure ecosystem. Um, I do want to make it clear that you know, we don't consider Exceed as the only thing in, in, in the broader community and the ecosystem, but we are a significant player in that space. Um, I think we're a, uh, we play well in the sandbox with everyone else, um, but we do cover a significant fraction of the, um, of the cross section of what people are doing and, and, and things that they're engaged in. Probably not surprising given the scale of the project. Um, we're uh, an organization that collaborates a lot with others. So um, this is not intended to be a slide that you read all the bullets on, but it's intended to make the point that we have currently 44, there may be a couple more awards that have been made recently, um, grants that have been uh, awarded over the last several years uh, and nine new in the last year with a total value of about $84 million, $85 million. <clears throat> and they, these are all uh, projects and proposals that have been submitted that I provide letters of collaboration on. Um, we're going to hear about the uh, extended collaborative support service projects. This does not include those. Um, and oh, by the way, we don't receive any funding from these grants. This is, we just do this as part of what we do. Um, often um, uh, those who are submitting these proposals were, will approach Exceed with a specific, <clears throat> a specific type, of, type of interaction that they're interested in. And, uh, and normally those things are, what we found are in line with what our objectives are um, in, in any case. So uh, we, we collaborate on those things at, at no cost to those grants. So there's a, a lot of leveraging of Exceed by these other awardees um, in ways other than, than those who are conducting research otherwise might make use of by getting an allocation or, or whatnot of, of, um, of Exceed provided resources. Um, a point of confusion that you will find, uh, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll bring this up now, but you'll, you'll scratch your head more later about it. Um, and you'll see this show up in, in some of the slides that you're gonna see coming up, and that is that um, we have this concept of reporting years and project years, um, and it is confusing. I, I understand that it is, there is actually reasoning behind it, and, and it's mostly this. <clears throat> um, for a number of years, uh, we were required to submit a annual report and uh, program plan. So an annual report for the, for the year just closed and a program plan for the, for the year coming. 
Um, and we had a problem. Uh, the problem was is that we couldn't report against the prior year until after the year closed so that we had all of the, the metrics measurements and statistics. So we actually couldn't report uh, until after the end of the year. Um, and often that's the way we were submitting our, 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 our um, annual report and program plan. The problem was that it includes the program plan, which is the plan for the coming year. And when um, our review panels would make comments or suggestions for changes in that plan, we would be some months into executing that plan. Uh, and, and then those, those changes would have to be accommodated in some way. That was very challenging. Uh, and so the current solution for this problem um, that uh, is really that NSF considers that NSF specified that there still be a single document submitted is that we now we have these reporting years that um, are, are shifted from the project years that allow us to submit an annual report and, pro and project plan that our program plan that, that reports on the reporting year that's closed. Um, and then also provides plans for the coming project year, which has not started as yet. So, um, so that allows us to, to avoid this constraint of being able to report and being able to accommodate uh, recommendations of the panel, uh, but it creates a confusion against what periods that we're talking about. So we will try to be very clear about when we're talking about a reporting year versus a project year. Um, and you can see how those lay out in that little chart in the upper right hand corner of this slide. Um, I am sure you'll be confused by this. That's okay. We'll sort it out as we go. <clears throat> um, I have a couple of slides of statistics here that I'm, I'm, I'm just gonna uh, jump past for the most part because you can take a look at these later. Um, you're gonna hear uh, echoes of a number of these things from uh, some of the other presentations. But uh, so these are slides that were taken from our most recent review this, this, uh, this past June. Um, and I think what you, what you can get from this by just glancing over it is we have a lot of impact in the, in the community. Uh, we, we intersect with many researchers in the community um, and uh, we deliver a lot of service. Uh, and, and we find that we're doing a pretty good job based on what um, the, the community is saying to us through our, our annual user survey. Um, but we always also look to continually improve. Um, as I said, we, we have a lot of focus on learning and workforce development, to deliver lots of training annually. Um, one of the interesting bits of that is we deliver um, we deliver a lot of training for those to those who don't actually use the resources that we allocate. So there's a considerable number of folks who are coming to exceed to get that training, and then they're applying it on other resources or in uh, other environments, which is absolutely fine. Um, uh, we're happy to be a resource to the broader community in that way. <clears throat> uh, and then here are a few things that we've been doing about continuing to develop and evolve the ecosystem to bring new capabilities into, uh, into the broader environment, uh, to integrate them into the exceed infrastructure. Um, uh, so these, in particular, in the first major bullet, we have resources funded by NSF that come and go over time. Um, and, uh, and we support those resources uh, and the transition of users from, from one resource to the next uh, as, as we progress through time. So, um, there's a lot of background in here. Again, a number of these things will be touched on by others as they go through their presentations. Um, another thing I wanted to make, uh, make clear is, uh, is as far as uh, how we impact the community. Um, one is that um, while we are funded by the, the NSF, we support the funded research um, uh, for researchers who are funded by any federal agency. Which is, a, which is a directive that we have received from, uh, from Congress. Um, so the, the interesting bit about that is, uh, so one of the measures we keep track of is how much uh, total federal research uh, uh, investment is being supported by access to exceed resources and services. And uh, as you can see for the period here during the exceed two award from September 16 through May of this year, it's over $2 billion in, in federally funded research and how it breaks out against the agencies is in the pie chart. Um, and so it, it might seem odd that the NSF um, uh, uh, investments in research that we're supporting only account for 30, 37% of our total um, funded, um, uh, total support of research funding, but it's because we have this mandate to support uh, research by any agency that we see this kind of distribution. So we have folks from other agencies or funded by other agencies 
um, who come and get allocations and, and use other services from Exceed. <clears throat> we run an annual user survey. Um, we think we're doing pretty good based on what the community is telling us. So we've had some very good ratings, particularly in the last several years uh, for, for what we're doing. Um, as a large and complex uh, plot project, however, there's still many things that uh, and services that Exceed provides that we have not been able to, to make the community as, as broadly aware of as we'd like to. So some things are obviously going to be things that are uh, that folks are well aware of, the, the website and user portal, the resources and, and, and several of the storage and, and related services that we provide. But there's a lot of other things that, that we do also that, that, um, that has been challenging for us to, uh, to really uh, make folks aware of. We continue to, to work down that and we'll, I'm sure we'll talk about this um, again, it's a recurring uh, topic for us uh, because we're always looking for, for strategies that we can, we can raise awareness in the community. Uh, one of the things that we always ask in, in the, the annual survey is, is what are the most important improvements that, that uh, they would like to see? Um, and this list of four um, items has been the same list for several years in the same order. Um, and so, uh, not surprisingly, uh, more resources that, that, that would be available to the community is a big thing. Um, for the, those new to the, to the panel, you'll find that we frequently talk about the lack of resources and how oversubscribed they are. It's a challenge for us to manage that. It's not something we control the solution to um, because those resources are funded by NSF through independent awards that work with us. So we, we have available to us to allocate whatever NSF makes available uh, for us to do that with. <clears throat> um, so again, and then software and storage capabilities, training, um, which we do a tremendous amount of and we do quite well, but there's always a need for more. Um, uh, and, and complicated by the fact that sort of every year we'll have a new crop of grad students who come in um, who, are, who are fresh to all this and need to be trained. Um, and then we will, uh, we constantly have uh, discussions about the allocations processes and policies. Um, that's, a, that's always a hot topic. Um, and, uh, and I'm sure we'll get into that in some depth over, over coming discussions. There are a few other examples of how we impact the, the, the community, particularly fiscally. Um, and this is largely leverage that, that folks get out of, out of NSF. So as I mentioned, the, the two billion in federally funded research over the last few years, but um, we have the Campus Champions Program, which will be discussed. Um, and in fact, these numbers aren't quite as up to date because we've had some additional folks come in. We're over 600 champions at this point. But you know, we we there's about a thirty million dollar value, approximately, in, in the effort that comes from the Champions Program, and and these are uh, volunteers from various institutions around the country um, that are participating in this program, um, uh, which has a number of goals, and and we'll hear more about that um, uh, from uh, from the CEE presentation. Um, uh, the ECSS projects, um, uh, I'm sure we'll we'll be hearing a bit about that also. But uh, the extended collaborative support service engages with research teams um, uh, rather deeply. Uh, they can be, uh, the service can be requested through the allocations process. So typically we're engaging folks over a period of month, uh, of a year or so, typically one year projects, um, and typically putting something like a quarter of an FTE of effort um, into that project. At the end of those projects that, that often, well, well, we'll hear more about the types of things, but they're often around uh, code optimization, porting, uh, uh, parallelization, um, and, and some other uh, aspects. But um, we, at the end of these projects, we talk to the PIs and ask them, you know, what's, what has really been the impact of your project? And, and most notably, how much time did your project save by this engagement um, instead of doing it on your own? And uh, so um, we see this pretty strong ROI as a result because they're seeing about on average 13 and a half months saved by their project for a three month investment on our part. So that's pretty good. Um, and the amount of time that that accounts for is about a, a $10 million value in the last, uh, in the last year. Uh, we work closely with XDMOD. Uh, it's a separately funded project under the same program at NSF and uh, their XDMOD is uh, Extreme Digital Metrics on Demand. Um, uh, and, and so they uh, collect a lot of the, the usage data and other things that, that are produced um, through seed monitoring and provide a portal that allows for analysis of that data. Um, uh, they have since 
spun that out into something called OpenXD mod. Uh, so while much of the development for that was, was driven by requirements from Exceed, this OpenXD mod release allows many others in the community to leverage this. And they don't have really great statistics on who, uh, who's using this or not, but they know of 300 installations around the, uh, around the, year, around the world um, using OpenXD mod. And then finally, um, we'll talk about science gateways uh, along the way here too. Um, but we have 38 registered gateways uh, that we are supporting in a variety of ways to exceed. They collectively have more than $83 million um, uh, in, in grants supporting a number of these, these gateways. So these are a number of ways in which exceed is leveraged and brings additional value to, to, um, to the research community. Um, I, I think it's pretty evident that uh, that there are measures here that exceed the annual budget of the uh, of the project. So we, we really like to make it clear where we're, we're providing this high level of return on investment. Okay, so I'm gonna stop there um, because I try to throw a bunch of things you want, but there's a bunch more to come. Um, if, any, if any of you had any questions really quickly, I, I, I'm happy to address them. Um, otherwise, we'll move to the next presentation. Any questions from anyone? Okay, not hearing anyone, any at this point, then uh, I will stop sharing. There you go. Okay, and Ron's gonna pull up the CEE slides so that Kelly can present. All right. Let me know, Leslie, when you're ready to go. Yep, just give us one quick second. Okay. There we go. Okay. So you're on the, the front slide? Yes. Okay. So hi, everybody. My name is Kelly Gaither. I'm from the Texas Advanced Computing Center here at UT Austin, and I'm the L2 Area Director for Community Engagement and Enrichment and also a co-PI on the project itself. My apologies for being in the car. My niece just had her baby about an hour ago. So uh, we are sort of en route to make everything happen. It happened a little earlier than we thought everything was gonna happen. So next slide. So the mission, um, just to broadly go over it, is really our mission in CEE is sort of to really proactively reach out to a broad and diverse cross section of the open science community. And we're really focused on bringing together um, resources, services, and, and also, I mean, I, I guess we really pretty much consider people a resource within the project, but really personally engaging those that are interested in using, integrating with, enabling, and enhancing the national, the national cyber infrastructure. Next slide. So the graph just shows you an overview that we, we are the front line beyond sort of the, the help desk ticketing system. We're the front line that reaches out to the lay public. We also engage potential users. So those who may not already know that they have an interest in digital resources and services, particularly at scale. We also do a lot of engagement with current users. And I'll go over all of the components, the five components of CEE. The first of which is workforce development. And work, this is a little bit of an old, old slide because workforce development now includes training and education. And again, I will go over each of these areas. It, student preparation goes in broadening participation now because that's really where we focus a lot on ensuring that we uh, recruit either from the faculty or from students or the lay public, a diverse cross-section and diversity. We really mean that in sort of all aspects of, the, of that uh, word. We also have user engagement. Um, again, sort of the front lines that are engaging our existing uh, user community. UII, which is, um, those are the people that actually work on our front end portal and web interface and sort of that's what that's the first thing that people see when they come to our resources and then campus engagement and that includes campus champions next slide so to dive a little deeper into workforce development these are the folks currently it's led by jennifer houchins of shodor um, and it will be until sometime uh, mid-August, or actually end of August, mid-September. These are the folks that really provide a continuum of learning resources and services 
to the Exceed community, and it's primarily through an integrated suite of trainings. We have a lot of informal learning resources, but we also do have semester-long resources that we do jointly with professors across the U.S., and that's really led out of our education department. Next slide. In training led by Susan Maringer of Cornell, they really do a great job of performing a gaps analysis, keeping up with current technology, current needs from our user community, either through those expressed through uh, user surveys or by direct communications with folks, um, just some in passing, some casual conversations. And by keeping up with what the community in general is using, they're the ones who do the gaps analysis, they develop the roadmaps, and then they really bring together uh, a suite of training materials. Some of them are actually developed at the sites themselves. Some are developed as a result of the gaps analysis, but really packaging them and making sure that the quality is, is quite high. We do this past year, we do now have a YouTube channel so that we have um, asynchronous training resources Again, a couple of these, I think it really originated with a course that was run out of Pittsburgh Supercomputing Center, but they're really high quality polished material. They also, the training area keeps up with the metrics for how many people are using these resources, where they come from, and um, really how useful they are. So they, they gather statistics on that. And in education, they actually work with supporting the faculty in all fields of study as it applies to advanced computing. Um, this, is, um, this is actually work that's done with Kate Cahill out of uh, Ohio Supercomputing Center and also Jennifer Houchins out of Shodor. So we do have a, uh, an interns program called the Empower Program that's run out of Shodor. And then the sort of the joint development um, or the co-development of semester-long courses is run by Kate. Next slide. Student preparation, as I said, that's been moved to broadening participation, but student preparation is run by Rosalia Gomez here at the Texas Advanced Computing Center. And she is really in charge of making sure that we actively recruit students to use the most of the resources, um, whether they're training or whether they are the actual hardware themselves and also the educational offerings. Um, we have a number of programs that I'll talk about a little later in broadening participation, but we have a number of programs that have been developed here in Exceed um, that are informal learning. They go with cohorts of students um, and really to engage those students that may not otherwise see themselves in advanced computing in general. Next slide. User engagement is in charge of uh, capturing community needs and requirements, but also gathering recommendations, whether they are formally or informally expressed, and then making sure that those get filtered out to the right areas in the project and closing the loop, making sure that they, it gets communicated back to the user community so that they know, um, for example, if they wanted a piece of software to be brought in or perhaps a tool to be developed and it would be useful to a, a broad uh, part of our user community, then that would be expressed. It would go to the proper area in uh, exceed wide um, and likely, very likely, not within CEE. Uh, and then once that was done, they would communicate that back to the user community themselves. That's actually led by Brian Sneed here at Tech as well. Next slide. Linda Ackley, and she also leads our diversity and inclusion efforts um, project wide. So she is at CERA. Uh, she has been working in broadening participation for decades now, um, and I've, I've had the good fortune of working with her for almost a decade, actually. Um, she's really in charge of making sure that the project, not just CEE, but the project actually engages underrepresented minority researchers from domains um, that may not be traditional HPC users or uh, people that really don't see themselves. So she and Rosie work together to ensure that we are 
working with existing faculty at perhaps small institutions or MSIs, or perhaps students from a, a broad portfolio of institutions across the U.S. to make sure that we are building and sustaining and maintaining a pipeline uh, that is diverse and inclusive. Next slide. User Interfaces and Online Information, or UII, is led by Maytal Dahan at TAC. Um, she's been working in the portals area for an, a number of years and worked on some of the original work for uh, what predated sort of the Exceed user portal. So that's really where this, this area is where they do all of the work sort of backstage, if you will, to make sure that we have the portal interface, where people can come through, they can actually understand their allocations, they can understand how to request other resources, they can look at training roadmaps, they can, there's a variety of information that they can access through that user portal, but they've also had a big hand in making sure that the user portal is effective at communicating to an existing user community, and then the website is very uh, effective at communicating at a potential user community. Next slide. And then campus engagement uh, includes campus champions, but it's really a little bit broader than that. Um, they are the ones who focus on sort of this community of practice that they've built over a number of years. They promote and facilitate participation of a diverse national community uh, that in the use of these particular resources um, so that they can actually foster scholarly achievement across a diverse portfolio. And that is co-led by Dana Brunson, who was at Oklahoma State and is now at Internet2, and Henry Neiman at the University of Oklahoma. And to the right, you can see sort of at, you know, it's, a, it's at any given moment when I show a graph of the champion institutions within a week or so it becomes outdated. So that, that gives you at that, at that point sort of an idea of how the broad diverse portfolio of institutions that are our champion institutions. And with that, uh, I'll open it up for questions, but that's just sort of a quick overview of CEE. Okay, you're not hearing any questions. I think um, next then we have ECSS. Um, Phil or Bob, are you able to share your slides? Certainly, this is Phil. Sorry, I, I saw XCI before me on the list, so I will pull up my slides. Okay, can everyone see the slides? Yep. Great. Uh, so my name is Phil Blood, um, and together with Bob Sinkovitz, who's also on the call, um, I direct um, the uh, Extended Collaborative Support Service, um, and Bob and I are also co-PIs on the project. Um, and so I'll give you a quick run through of ECSS. Let's put this into present mode here. Okay. So the mission of ECSS is to um, develop meaningful collaborations with researchers to optimize their applications, improve their work in data flows, increase their um, increase the effectiveness of their use of uh, the infrastructure that's provided through Exceed. And so the key here um, is this extended part. Uh, we collaborate with researchers in many ways. Um, um, uh, the Exceed ticket, um, um, the, the, like, uh, the, the community um, outreach group and, and many elements of Exceed are, are, are um, interacting with users um, in, in many ways. And 
Um, we answer the tickets and, and, and work with them through issues on the systems. And so ECSS is really focused on those collaborations that require more than sort of the first level or even maybe a second level of support, but uh, really an extended collaboration, as John mentioned, over the period of um, a year, um, up to a year, and uh, getting in with the teams. And we focus on this collaborative aspect in that um, the, the, the t these research groups aren't just giving us a problem to solve, um, but we identify members of the team to work with and really collaborate with the scientists and um, help them to make progress and to we and learn from each other so that they can um, also take uh, what they learn through the process back into their groups and and be able to improve how they do things there so um, so this is a, a big investment uh, in exceed there's um, about 82 staff um, that number fluctuates as John said we you know we, we continually are are bringing people in and others are, are moving out, but um, around 80 staff in, um, in, are providing some level of their time um, in ECSS. Um, that's about 29 FTEs. And that's broken out over a number of different um, groups that I'm going to, to talk about um, here I'll, in this uh, next slide. So over um, what we call ECSS projects, we have two groups. One is extended support for research teams, and uh, this is the classic ECSS, what I'd say the classic ECSS uh, 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 model where a research group wants help uh, with their code or, or with a specific thing. An individual research group needs, needs support, and we identify the right um, ECSS staff person to work with them, and, um, and they work um, collaboratively with this research group on a particular their, their individual research problem and um, and optimize their code or, or whatever the, 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 the task may be um, and so this is the the largest group um, in ECSS in terms of the numbers of projects and uh, the, the the number of people who are involved um, and so Together with that, um, under ECSS projects is this uh, novel and innovative projects group. And this group is focused on the um, domains of science and the, the users who have not typically been um, uh, uh, very active in using the uh, national cyber infrastructure. Uh, resources uh, like are made available through uh, the, the national supercomputing centers. and um, reaching out to these groups and helping them to uh, take advantage of the resources that are available and help them get started in, in, in using these and mentoring these projects that often are, are smaller scale uh, projects uh, but are becoming more and more significant. Um, often these are data-driven um, uh, uh, sciences and um, and also now uh, other domains that are bringing in um, data-centric approaches, um, like for example, AI and machine learning and, and that sort of thing. So those, those two areas are um, the ECSS projects that um, I directly oversee. And then um, Bob focuses on what we call ECSS communities, um, which is uh, extended support for community codes, which is very similar to extended support for research teams, um, but has uh, more of a focus on um, helping to uh, develop and optimize codes that are widely used within um, different scientific communities. Uh, the extended support for science gateways focuses on um, helping teams who, have, who want to put up a science gateway that is backed by Exceed resources and integrating that gateway with, with the Exceed resources. And then um, extended support for training, education, and, and outreach. Um, uh, does basically what the, the name implies that um, we're in, in, in effect, we're um, supporting uh, the, the, all the education, uh, training and outreach activities in Exceed with the um, expertise that we bring um, from the, the ECSS experts um, in, in these various areas that, that uh, um, of, of code optimization and data and workflows. Um, bringing that expertise to support these efforts to train and educate and and help uh, the community to 
to develop their, their skills in these areas. And then um, very importantly, uh, we're supported in all these efforts by an excellent project management team um, uh, that helps us to keep track of, of this very large uh, um, uh, pro uh, piece of the project with, with 80 uh, different staff and, and many different types of projects going on. So I um, just want to make a note of the time here. Um, so, um, so I just actually went through this slide, so I'll leave it here and, and folks can look at it again. But, uh, but these are the, the different ECSS areas um, that we support. And I'll be talking a little bit more about some examples of, of some of the work that's done in these different areas as we, um, in, in, a, in a couple of minutes. We, as John indicated, we track our performance um, and try to be responsive to the community. And so um, these are our key performance indicators that we use to see how we're um, doing with uh, achieving our goals. Um, we look at, uh, so, so what happens is after every ECSS project is completed, then uh, either Bob or I will reach out to um, the, the PI of the recently completed project. We'll interview them and talk to them about how it went. We'll get feedback that we can bring back um, into um, the process to help us improve. And um, also we take some, some um, uh, we get some numbers from them in terms of their satisfaction and their uh, impressions of the impact uh, that the project has had on their, on their research. And these are the KPIs that we, uh, that we report to exceed or to uh, NSF in addition to, the, in addition to the return on investment numbers that, that John indicated. So, um, so we, we set a very high bar here uh, for us and, and we've um, been successful in, in, in meeting, these, uh, meeting these goals. And so just to um, give a, a quick insight into things that are important to us right now in, 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 um, in ECSS, we're always looking to stay at the cutting edge and maybe hopefully to get out in front of, of, of the trends uh, to the extent possible so that we're uh, prepared to help people to with the, the the latest challenges in advanced research computing. And so we have a strong focus on professional development for the ECSS staff. We are looking at providing more ways for the staff to um, hone their skills and to develop new skills and, and new capacity that will uh, enable us to to help at the cutting edge of, of research. And so th that's a big focus. We're um, also, we know we're not the, as John said, not the only game in town and we're working with other similar organizations, in particular those similar, doing similar things to what we're doing in ECSS and uh, reaching out to share best practices and, and learn from the community. And, um, and also uh, we have this wonderful program um, uh, that Kelly mentioned of the, the campus champions and, um, and the, that, has grown out of Exceed and is becoming its own community of practice um, on the campuses, working with researchers um, and helping them uh, do what we do with, in Exceed, but on, on, on their individual campus and campus resources and even helping them get to the national infrastructure as well. And uh, so we're looking at ways we can work more closely with them to learn from them and also to leverage the mutual interest there um, to, again, sort of do that a second to last thing, which is lower barriers um, to using these resources and also to taking advantage of, of the opportunity to collaborate with, with us in ECSS. Um, and so, so we do a lot of outreach and that's also part of this proactive um, project development. And uh, not just to, 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 ever, to all the researchers, but also especially focused on these, these non-traditional communities that, uh, that we're trying to help um, overcome barriers to to using the resources. So, um, so those are some of our key priorities in this upcoming year. And I'm going to just dive in now and go into a little more detail about what ECSS is and the types of projects that we're working on um, just in the next, I think, five minutes that I've got left. So, um, as John mentioned, we have a, a wide uh, range of expertise in doing different things. The classic thing is, is doing performance analysis and optimization of codes. 
um, but we also help people get started on new architectures that come in this coming year. We've got, a, for the first time, an ARM uh, based system that will be coming into Exceed, and so there'll be an interesting opportunity for ECSS to help people to uh, take advantage of that resource. Um, we're in performance analysis and optimization includes parallelization and scalability, but also there's these other aspects uh, that I mentioned, uh, gateway and portal development, um, tying these things into the back ends of uh, the back end of these portals into exceed resources, um, helping people to develop workflows that um, are efficient and can take advantage of the exceed resources. Um, doing things like the AI and machine learning, uh, which is very specialized uh, skill set and optimizing and, uh, and defining the I, did we lose? Is it just me or did we lose him? Uh, yes. I can't hear him. Well, I, I, you lost him. He's still logged in, but he's we're getting nothing from him. Yeah. Um, Bob, are you on? Can you maybe hop in until Phil? Yeah, I'm, I'm here. Um, oh, I don't have the slides pulled up though. Oh. What, um, I'm trying to get a hold of them. But Leslie, can can you okay, can you start sharing the slides and then I'll pick up from here. Um, there's. Are you not seeing the slides that are shared? But you oh, can. I, I am seeing them. Yeah. Are you advancing or Phil is or is Phil? Phil is advancing. Uh, okay. Can you hear me now? Oh, oh now we can. Oh, good. You're back. Right. I I could hear you all the whole time. Uh, so. <laughs> I'm not sure what happened there. Um, okay, I'm back and I'll, I'll speed on through here. Um, all right. Okay, so there we go. Okay. Um, we allocate ECSS uh, along with the time on the various systems that we provide. We, we allocate ECSS as a service. As John mentioned, usually we're allocating about 20 to 25% of uh, staff time for one of our ECSS uh, consultants. And um, typically that lasts up to a year. Um, people then can, they can renew that um, and, and for another year, but we, 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 we go only usually up to a year uh, with any given project. And then we do a final report. And, and if a, a, you know, a follow on project is indicated, then, then we can also support that but they, they have to apply for that um, again in their, their, their following um, application for Exceed resources. Uh, one of the keys to success um, of, I think, Exceed overall, um, and especially ECSS, has been that we're able to tap into the wonderful expertise that is spread across all these different institutions that make up Exceed. And we would, in any one institution, would not be able to support all the different uh, requests from the national community that, that we get. Um, and so we're able to um, cross pollinate across the sites and uh, a service or a resource that is you know, available at San Diego can, can benefit from expertise that's at PSC and, and vice versa. And uh, so this is a great um, uh, help to, to the community and to us. Uh, to the application process is, is the barrier is pretty low here. We ask them five questions and, and we take these into account. We follow up with them as needed. We want people to be successful with this. If people need help, we want to we want to help them. So uh, we keep the, the barrier to entry low, but it is reviewed by the by the Exceed uh, Resource Allocation Committee, and um, they they give the the recommendation of whether it should be an ACSS project or not. But then we t we and we take that into consideration and and follow up uh, with with the group. Um, Anyone can apply for ECSS, not limited to people who are doing really advanced, what we advantational uh, uh, research or, or things that are, you know, that could be, um, like I said, for those who have never used these resources before, all, you know, to these very large projects that are very sophisticated use of the systems. Um, we, we work with them all. And a lot of them are in fact, the smaller scale um, uh, 
projects that uh, that need 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 a lot more help than those who maybe have been doing this for for decades. But we work we work with and we contribute to to all of these. Uh, we span many disciplines. Um, this this shows um, just for. Uh, the, the uh, reporting year three, all the different fields of science that uh, we supported um, through ECSS projects. And again, this reemphasizes the need to have this broad expertise that we can pull together and exceed uh, from all these different centers and, and the folks that they've trained up and uh, from all these different science domains and, and computational backgrounds. Uh, this is, you can go through and look at, you know, our latest numbers from this year. Um, the, as I mentioned, we, we maintain these high impact and satisfaction ratings from the PIs as we interview them. Um, we, we run a bunch of uh, symposia from the ECSS experts who have completed these projects to share the results with the broader community. Um, we also help review um, some of the XRAC proposals uh, that, uh, that come in um, for exceed resources and, um, and do a lot of proactive outreach. I'm gonna hit these, so I think my time is is up, and I don't want to set us behind. So um, I leave. I, I'll, I'll briefly step through these, but leave them uh, for you to look at um, um, on your own. Uh, th these are examples here. These next few slides of the different types of projects that that we're doing in the different areas. So this ESRT uh, extended support for research teams. Um, again, the classic. Uh, this is an example of a classic optimization effort uh, with a code um, um, optimizing a routine um, that's doing a conjugate gradient algorithm and getting a 50% speed up in that and, and having a large effect on, on the code. And these are all you know, very interesting and cool science projects as well. This one's contributing to um, you know, key issues with being able to do accurate uh, uh, global climate models. Um, this is a novel and innovative, pro innovative projects example of contributing to developing the deep, uh, uh, deep learning framework uh, that is being used um, to um, analyze traffic um, at uh, intersections and uh, contributing to being able to optimize these things um, and having a you know, real world impact in that way. Um, and I mentioned that uh, Novel Innovative Projects also proactively goes out and identifies exceed grants from these non-traditional uh, research communities, non-traditional in the sense that they're not using Exceed and, and National CI um, uh, very prevalently in the community, and, and working with them uh, and reaching out to them to see if how we can help them and uh, lower the barriers there. Um, this is an example of extended support for community code uh, project, um, uh, working on a code that is being used to model um, the interaction of active galactic nuclei with the surrounding galaxies and again optimizing the parallelization there to, to get a 5x speed up um, and uh, in the extended support for science gateways uh, side um, helping to uh, to design this this gateway um, for um, uh, this interactive adaption and collaboration tool for managing uh, water energy and, and land so um, and then finally uh, the I talked about the ESTEO, the Extended Support for Training, Education, and Outreach. One, th this group does a lot of great things, and, and one uh, really um, great program that we're supporting is this Campus Champion Fellows Program that pairs an Exceed staff member with a Campus Champion for a one-year intensive collaboration. It's not limited to ECSS, but ECSS provides uh, a number of the mentors that, that work with the Campus Champions in this role. and. Um, so far, uh, we've, we've mentored 30 fellows on 33 separate projects. Um, and then finally, I mentioned at, the, uh, at one point the ECSS symposium series that we're doing that allows the, the ECSS staff members to exchange uh, information about what they've been able to do in their projects and share some of the technical background and, and best practices. Um, these are held usually monthly. Um, so we welcome you to go and check this out. There's a link there, um, and we welcome you to attend and, and see in more detail what type of work the ECSS staff are doing. And I will close there and invite any questions if there's time. Okay, thanks so much, Phil. Thank you. Step, we have XCI, um, and I believe Rick is going to be presenting. 
Right. So, Paul, I'll uh, just need you to stop. Uh, Rick, I'll just, or uh, sorry, Phil, I'll just need you to stop presenting. There we go. Are you um, able to present, Rick, or do you need yeah. to for you? Yeah, uh, here we go. We're going to give this a try. <laughs> um, let's see. Did that work? Yeah, we can see. Uh, okay, so I'm on the wrong thing here. Uh, can you see uh, Exceed Cyber Infrastructure Integration? Sure can. Okay. All right. So um, I'll even be more daring. Uh, sorry about that. Um, so Rich Nepper and I are going to split this. I'm going to do an introduction and then I'll keep flipping the slides. And um, when, uh, when it gets to Rich's part, he'll just say next slide and I will do that. So um, we're going to um, step briefly into the um, the Exceed Cyber Infrastructure Integration part of the project. And uh, because Exceed is such a diverse um, and extended organization with lots of different moving parts, there, uh, there's a real need for integration at all levels. And uh, the XCI's group has several kinds of integration functions to perform. But uh, basically, um, there's this simple process here that um, leads to um, operational CI through a process of identifying and prioritizing needs of various types, preparing solutions, and then operationalizing it. So there's a coordination and um, uh, sort of moving this whole process forward through uh, uh, needs analysis, use case generation, work by software partners and CI providers, and then um, finally an operational and support phase for whatever it is. It can be a piece of software or a uh, machine resource or um, uh, other kinds of things. And I'll get to some, some more extended integration activities here in just a minute. Um, so, whoops. So uh, the um, <clears throat> capabilities that the XCI group provides are in blue on this slide and those provided by other groups are in green. Um, the services um, extend across the Exceed Federation and work with service providers uh, and their resources. So on the left side, uh, XCI uh, works on uniform security services across uh, the Federation, uh, login services, data services, and information services about hardware and software and, and other uh, things that uh, people are interested in using. Um, on the right side, the service providers um, connect by providing descriptions and status of, of their, their resources, um, execution interfaces, so you can run jobs and um, move data and things of that nature. And then, um, of course, the, the sort of basic authentication and authorization functions through Exceed, I mean, through, uh, uh, through the login um, function. So I'm going to turn it over to Rich here to talk about the uh, the Rack D team. So I'm, I'm uh, Rich Nepper. I'm the I'm actually the manager for <clears throat> cyber infrastructure resource integration. I'm filling in for JP Navarro, who's the uh, requirements analysis and capability delivery uh, manager. So um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, so the Rack D team. Um, it essentially goes out and, and gathers requirements for capabilities that will be integrated into Exceed. Um, they have a registry of use cases. They're very good on process in terms of uh, documenting uh, the needs in, in the form of formalized use cases, which are all available through the Exceed website. Um, uh, they, they have what's known as the, um, the, the requirements uh, prioritization process uh, with a board called the UREP. Um, where, where essentially they, they review um, periodically all of the uh, capabilities of interest and those, those are prioritized based on the value to exceed users. Um, as that, uh, as that, that, that software is prioritized, um, JP's team works to prepare it uh, to be integrated with the exceed overall environment 
Uh, some of that is work with the, the software creators and developers. Some of it is integrating with the service providers and making sure that the service providers can install that software on their systems. Um, and then to exceed enterprise services uh, so that it all integrates tightly together throughout the exceed ecosystem. Uh, they also do evaluation and testing, both looking at the, the new capabilities that are available, um, as well as making sure that everything works once it's in place and integrated with the exceed environment. Um, and then, as of course, uh, um, they follow that, that these software capabilities throughout their life cycle, uh, make sure that uh, they're updated if there's any enhancements that are required, if there's security issues or bug fixes that need to be put in place. Um, next slide, please. Oh, you went too far one. Yeah, I don't know what's going on here. Um, there, sorry. Is that it? Or is there one more back? Okay. That's, there we go. that's forward. <laughs> I'm sorry. I don't know what's going on here. There we go. Okay. Stay there. Don't move. <laughs> um, so the RACD team is, is uh, currently involved in, in a number of, of um, software pushes that are, some, some of these are more finished than others. Um, so the web single sign on is complete at this point. Um, there, there are some remaining uh, pieces that need to be integrated. Uh, the research software portal is something that's an ongoing offering, which is essentially software.exceed.org, a place where uh, people who are developing software as well as users um, and uh, cyber infrastructure uh, integrators who are installing the software can all uh, identify software that's relevant to them, um, get documentations uh, for it and, and make use of it. Uh, the Kepler workflow service is a graphical uh, data management and, and workflow service th that's developed out of San Diego, which allows users to create um, pi essentially pipelines for getting uh, analysis done. Um, also, uh, the team is, has worked really hard on uh, completing Globus Auth uh, for all of Exceed. So we have a full federated auth based on Globus. Um, and uh, Data, uh, data transfer with the Globus data transfer client. Uh, currently, the team is evaluating um, some data discovery tools, which should help uh, users identify useful data sets for their particular resource. And then there's um, uh, a tool to, to be able to manage group affiliations so that your science group can all work together um, and be identified to exceed as, uh, as a team that's working together. Uh, the the Exceed service provider data that comes across to Exceed that Rick was describing uh, a few slides back is part of this resource description repository. So um, the service provider resources automatically describe their capabilities to the, the resource description repository, and then users can find resources which meet their needs uh, through the Exceed website. Um, Finally, there's some further out investigations trying to find uh, good approaches to federated access um, that can be uh, that can be integrated across Exceed and to other um, folks who want to be part of the federation but not completely in, uh, integrated. Uh, and finally, um, there's some some work doing metrics on return on investment to understand what do, what do particular efforts uh, mean in terms of science benefit. And I think that's that's it for Rack D. Okay, so um, the uh, XCRI team has a number of sub teams with various focus areas beyond uh, Rack D, um, and these have to do with uh, the various kinds of integration. Um, the first um, subgroup is service provider coordination, and service providers are. Um, uh, across the board, there are the level ones uh, with uh, at the supercomputer centers and level twos um, who are um, making significant um, contributions to exceed resources and then level threes who um, are providing some capabilities. Uh, so coordinating all of those groups of people is a major um, piece of work. Um, another area uh, is uh, coordination of, of the 
the organization and management of software toolkits. Um, we have lots and lots of things in place already, but people are always interested in new capabilities. So these are, um, these are uh, evaluated and then put in the stream of components to add to, to existing toolkits. Uh, there are um, uh, sort of a, a different a variety of needs that people have when you reach out all the way to campuses. Um, and a part of uh, the integration work here is trying to make it easy for people on campus, campuses to move between Exceed and their, uh, their own local resources by trying to, to create a more Exceed-like environment on the, on the campuses. Uh, and that's done through, um, first of all, offering that as a possibility and then providing on-site and remote consultations to help those institutions make whatever changes or create whatever infrastructure they need to, to support their uh, researchers. Uh, and as a concomitant, provide training and workshops on how, how to administer these systems. Um, beyond uh, you know, creating new things, uh, there's a need to support and maintain existing things, which um, includes processes for pushing updates and new features that have been evaluated and approved and bug fixes uh, into these toolkits and um, maintaining the, the social interactions and, and communication between collaborating institutions that both provide toolkit components and use them. And, um, you know, engaging new and existing partners uh, in the requirements to solutions cycle. Uh, basically, everybody um, has a problem and everybody wants a solution. And if we can all work together, um, you know, in, in kind of a, a, a more focused way, we can come up with solutions faster that, that, um, that can be deployed. All right, let's see if this moves. I think that's the last one, actually. So I'm going to leave it at that and pass it back to Leslie. Okay, any questions for Rick or Rich? Okay, good, good deal. Um, next, we will have Greg presenting about operations. Okay, you hear me okay? Sure can. Okay, let me see if I can't get this to work. Can you see that okay? Looks good. Actually, is that the, is that the presentation view or is that my? Uh, it's the presentation view. Yeah, okay. Hold on. I, I think I told it to do the wrong one. Mm. Let me just pull this bad boy over here and then see if we can get it to work this way. Yeah. I hate doing this. Yeah, it looks good. Uh, that's, yeah, good. good enough. that's fair enough. Okay. Um, so you guys can see what's coming up too then. Okay. So I, I'm the director of operations. I'm Greg Peterson uh, at Tennessee. And uh, this is probably uh, the most important thing for us to kind of walk through for folks that are new. So the operations uh, uh, for Exceed is broken up into um, basically the office plus then four subsets. Um, but the overall mission for what we're, we're, we're doing is, is loosely, loosely speaking, we're just gonna keep um, making sure that all the trains are running on time. So we have a bunch of different services that we provide uh, that we're going to uh, make sure they run. So, so it says on this statement, you know, that we're gonna install, connect, maintain, et cetera, all this stuff. Uh, but we, we're broken into pieces. So we've got the cybersecurity group and their job is basically to uh, make sure that we don't have any problems with, with hackers coming in and, and um, owning our services or ca causing trouble or, or any of that kind of stuff. And so there's a lot of coordination that goes on between the various uh, centers that are participating and um, making sure that all of our services are appropriately patched and, and all kinds of training and whatnot uh, to try to uh, make sure that when a user comes in to, uh, in to exceed, that our services are up and running and they haven't been out. Uh, we also have the data transfer services. And so those folks are all about helping users with being able to uh, move their data around. So bringing it into uh, the various centers, getting their results back to where, uh, wherever they need to take them to, uh, et cetera. And so 
Uh, there's a lot of work with, with those folks and that includes uh, interactions with internet too and making sure that our networking performance is good. And uh, we have a persona mesh that they, that they um, run and you know, a bunch of things like that. Uh, then the Exceed Operations Center, that's basically our help desk. So folks can, um, if they have any kind of an issue, a user has an issue, they, they can uh, contact the help desk uh, and that's at, um, at UIUC, it's at NCSA. And so if you've got some sort of an issue, you can get on the phone and call them. You can send them an email uh, to help at exceed.org uh, or you can um, uh, do a web form. So any of those ways to report any kind of an issue, it'll first get, hit the, uh, the help desk, they triage it, and if they can solve the problem immediately, they do, and that, that happens you know, about a quarter of the time. Uh, about half the time, the tickets get forwarded on to the service providers because it's some, some issue with a particular service provider, say, uh, for example, Comet or Bridges or, or Stampede 2 or any of those kinds of, of things. And then about a quarter of the time, they get routed to the rest of the project for some other piece, for example, uh, something related to um, allocations or something like that, it's, that's the most common one. So, uh, so the XOC does that. Uh, so they help with triaging and they also monitor things uh, to make sure nothing goes down overnight when people are sleeping, et cetera. And then the last group is our SysOps group. So the, the uh, SysOps group basically runs our central services. So for Exceed, we have um, on the order of 50 different uh, central services and those provide all kinds of things. So for example, we've got the, uh, uh, the portal, we've got the web page, uh, we've got the single sign-on hub. Uh, we've just got a whole slew of different kinds of things. A lot of this stuff is going on in the background where users don't really ever see it, but um, their job is to make sure that all those systems have been uh, installed, patched, maintained, and, and all, all of that. Uh, we work pretty hard to make sure that um, things don't go down so it doesn't affect users, uh, and we have failovers and all that kind of thing to, to make sure that if there is any kind of patching or maintenance to be done, or if there's an issue that happens at one site where services, another site will, will pick it up pretty quickly. So overall, um, that's basically all the pieces uh, of operations, and it's all about making things work. And so if you look at the staffing areas within there, overall, we've got the mid-30s total number of people, uh, or about 16 FTEs up across all these areas. And uh, decorated within those boxes are all the various L3s. Uh, one thing I would say is the name inside of the XOC, Dan, is going to change soon um, because Mike Pingleton retired and Dan's been subbing in and imminently we expect to have a new uh, L3 for the XOC. Okay, so moving on, just to kind of give you a, a sense of how we see if we're doing a good job, we have, of course, our, our key performance indicators uh, within ops. And so the ones that, that are the, uh, I guess, the most visible for us is how much time do we have of downtime because of security incidents. And so our target for that is zero. We, we don't ever want to have anything down that users see uh, because of security. And then the next thing is when we have the, uh, the help desk, the XOC close up tickets, we basically sample folks to see, well, uh, were you happy with the service that we provided you? You know, was it, was it quick enough? Was it good quality and all that sort of thing? And so we have a target of getting at least a 4.5 out of five on their satisfaction. So that's a, a pretty, uh, high number uh, to meet, but those are our, our targets. And for PY8 last year, we had no downtime. And then you can see that the overall for the year satisfaction for the XOC tickets was a 4.7. And then just below that, you can see each of the, the four quarterly numbers. So overall, um, we met those targets. And so I'm pretty happy with that. While we talk about tickets, this picture right here illustrates the numbers of tickets we've had for the program. So um, so, of course, even though this is exceed two, uh, and we're talking about uh, basically running through the third year of, of the exceed two, the original exceed project, uh, year one through eight, you can see uh, we were having about a thousand tickets a month for the first, say, five ish years, but it's jumped up and so now it's starting to approach more like 1500 per month. Uh, so, we get a, a pretty good number of tickets that we have to deal with. And the ticket response time for the help desk is 0.6 hours. That's the mean time. And across the, uh, the overall project, all the ones that uh, get, uh, get, get dealt with by uh, any of the areas within Exceed, uh, it's about 18 hours. Usually the ones that get routed within the project are, are the more complicated ones. And so we're pretty proud that we, we've, um, especially for the XOC, that uh, the response time is you know, on the order of a little over half an hour on average. And people are, are very pleased with the, with the results that they get. So it's not just that we're uh, just closing it out, we're actually giving them good answers. 
Okay, so just to give you a sense of what, what all we did last year, uh, these are just some of the accomplishments we talked about. Uh, so we have a 99.9% uh, uptime, or I should say availability uh, target for all of the exceed services. And so we met that again. Uh, we actually compute that across the critical services using a geometric mean, so it's really hard to hide. So um, there's, there's uh, no hiding from any one of the uh, um, services that aren't doing well. So um, we're doing a, a really good job on that front. So we're pretty proud of that. Uh, and that's, so that takes a lot of work. Similarly, we've had no security incidents or any downtime because of security incidents. Um, so uh, that's, that's also really good news. So that's uh, uh, the result of a lot of, of uh, joint efforts. So all the stuff we just heard from XCI a minute ago is part of all of that. So uh, that's great. Um, as far as some of our priorities for where we're going to be going for the next year, we'll be uh, are focusing on continuing to, to have high availability. We want to continue to have a lot of coordination between the sysops and the security group groups to make sure that these uh, services stay up. So uh, it's not just because of security or sysops, they actually have to work together a lot in order to keep these, um, these systems up and running and, and to minimize any kinds of, of issues. Uh, so all of that together means we can maintain our security posture. That's our plan. That's kind of the, one of the biggest things we really focused on. Um, but at the same time, we've been uh, doing exercises like looking at uh, the NIST 800-171, which is basically the uh, standard for looking at control, uh, but unclassified information. And so we've been doing an analysis and, and basically looking through what kinds of capabilities do we have. And so at the last panel, we actually spent a fair amount of time discussing uh, what the future is for uh, exceed looking at various kinds of sensitive data because that seems to be something that's coming on the horizon so we're talking about that this year and of course uh, we can will continue to uh, respond to user tickets uh, and support various types of data transfers for our user uh, community uh, and that includes looking at emerging networking kinds of capabilities data transfer technology so if there's a new thing that comes along we want to be ready for it so we're constantly looking at those kinds of things and my last slide basically is a bunch of questions but um essentially uh, i want to just toss it out there and ask if any, anyone has any questions about ops i guess i was really clear you must have been <laughs> Thanks, Greg. Okay. Um, next up, we have Dave talking about RAS. Yep. Hello, I'm Dave Hart uh, from NCAR, and let me see how screen sharing works for me here. And if I present, is it going to? Looks good. Looks good. All right. So, yes, I'm the director for uh, the resource allocation service. And um, not surprisingly, our mission is to allocate resources. Um, the, the detailed mission statement is there, but uh, the picture on the, on the right is how I uh, think of this. Um, you know, with the RAS-centric view of Exceed, where RAS is in the middle, uh, we support policy by providing, uh, or policy is fed to us by en engaging the NSF, ex the rest of Exceed, service providers and users. Uh, we help planning uh, at the bottom there by providing information to NSF, working with XD mod service providers and the evaluation team. But most of our effort goes in the middle where we have users, the ECSS support uh, service, uh, the engagement efforts, service providers, funnel them through the RAS uh, processes where we marry users with resources and support services to produce science results. Uh, in terms of organization, there's uh, two main areas within RAS, the allocations process and policies area led by Ken Hackworth at Pittsburgh is uh, handles the day to day management of uh, allocation requests, including the four quarterly extract meetings. And then the uh, second area led by Esther Soriano of uh, Illinois at NCSA and NCSA is the allocations accounting and account management team. That's the development group that operates, uh, updates and improves the XRAS system, the central database and the accounting service and other areas. Um, a couple of quick uh, acronyms that might come up through here. So if I say RAS, that's the uh, L2 area that we're just talking about here. XRAS is the software tool, even though it has the exact same name as the Exceed Resource Allocation Service, but it's the, the software tool we build. 
XRAC is the actual panel of experts who reviews uh, allocation requests four times a year. And the XDCDB is our central database that supports many RAS and non-RAS services across Exceed. Uh, in terms of key metrics, we have three key ones that RAS monitors. Um, the first two are both user satisfaction related, one specifically with the allocations process. You know, are they getting what they need out of the, the, the activities and uh, awards? And then user satisfaction with the XRAS system. Uh, both of those, uh, we've steadily gotten ratings of 4.0 on a five scale, or 4.0 or better on a five scale. And we've seen uh, some of those ratings tick up to over 4.2 on our most recent surveys. Uh, the third metric is the success rate for requests to the quarterly research uh, opportunities. And here we've defined success as being they don't get rejected outright. Um, so any, any award is considered some form of success. And we've set a target of 85% of requests being submitted, seeing some sort of award. And that number, uh, reason we've set it as a target, it was uh, languishing in the 60% range for some XRAC meetings. So we've been targeting those efforts and seeing steady progress. And at the most recent meeting, we hit 81% success rate. So we're, we're continuing to work that number. Uh, people put a lot of time and effort both on the reviewer side and on the uh, submitter side and just having them outright rejected for um, technicalities or failing to understand the process are, is, is not how we want them to experience exceed. Uh, we do track lots of metrics as the allocations and accounting side of things. We have lots of data that we can look at. Um, so we do report many allocation usage metrics. We also watch uptime for XRAS, though since we moved all the XRAS services to the Amazon cloud, we've seen essentially 100% uptime. And we also keep make sure that the startup requests that come in continually uh, see reasonable turnaround. And we've been seeing about 10 day turnaround time for those, uh, which is better than our actual uh, two week target. Um, in the last reporting year, RAS had a number of successes. I mean, allocation is always job one. So managing the 933 research requests across four quarterly meetings, plus 921 startup requests, and then uh, an additional almost 200 educational, uh, meaning classroom uh, and training requests. Um, the where that all those requests come in is the environment that you see on the in the graphic on the right shows the over request levels at the extract meetings. The red uh, part of the graph shows the actual request levels. The orange shows that's the amount that's actually available. The panel gets us to the, the light blue line in the middle there and reduces the requests. And then the black line is our actual awards made to match closely matching the amounts available. But trying to keep users happy in an environment where the request levels are substantially higher, sometimes five or six times higher than the available amounts is, is a challenging uh, space for us to work in. So we try to keep users happy by enhancing the process. So this past year in the reporting year, we enhanced the submit UI with several autofill features that seem to, to have uh, a, a good impact. It may have contributed to the uptick in satisfaction we saw. Uh, we've been seeing a steady progress on that success rate. Uh, we did approve several startups that were longer than a year. We're trying to incorporate multi-year allocations into this process. And we did a lot of work to streamline the administrative workflows to allow the RAS team to work more efficiently in, in, in getting the work done. Um, in that context of fulfilling our mission to bring together users, resources, and support, we have a couple of internal goals for ourselves. Um, we want to, we're looking to try to get XRAS to be a self-sustaining a service for uh, in a non-subsidized mode for outside its clients. So XRAS is used by XE, but it's also a software as a service um, product that we can make available to outside clients. And we have several clients that I'll highlight in just a moment. Um, we are trying to increase the avail visibility of information about open science shared research infrastructure through Exceed. So not only do we communicate about Exceed allocated resources, but we have some information displayed about other uh, resources in the ecosystem that might be available to, to certain users. Um, we want to help improve the understanding of the scientific impact of shared research infrastructure and um, just generally make a much more reliable, maintainable uh, allocations, accounting, and database infrastructure for the ecosystem. 
And we're taking steps uh, throughout uh, the rest of Exceed on those areas. So as I mentioned, XRAS as a service, uh, our current clients include Exceed with the client number one, obviously. Um, NCAR's Computational Information Systems Lab has been using XRAS to manage its allocations process for, since 2015. Uh, NCAR's Earth Observing Lab um, has been using XRAS since last year. And you can see on the right there, the picture of the aircraft and their front end that they developed for XRAS. They, out, they don't allocate resources, they, or HPC resources, they allocate observational uh, facilities. Um, the Pittsburgh Supercomputing Center joined this year, helping uh, with the allocations for their Anton system, which is not allocated through Exceed. And early on in the, uh, we had the NS NCSA Cadence project uh, and helped them review requests for uh, visualization support. And we're still working uh, on looking for new clients. Uh, some conversations we're having include the Frontera system. Uh, that conversation depends on how their operational uh, processes are gonna work. Uh, we're likely to support uh, the PRACE exceed risk collaboration with a special XRAS instance. We also have some preliminary conversations with the Carnegie Mellon Campus Cloud and also uh, NERSC, uh, which is a DOE user facility. Um, in terms of increasing information about the science impact of these allocations, RAS and the Exceed Portal team have recently completed integration with the ORCID ecosystem, uh, which allows us now to post allocation awards to users' ORCID profiles. Through the Exceed Portal, um, users can link their Exceed identities with ORCID profiles and, and give us permission to do this. Um, the RDR, our resource descriptions repository, has provided uh, unique IDs and public pages for the resources, and XRAS. Once awards are made, it is able to post allocation awards to ORCID profiles in the same way that you might see a publication associated with an ORCID user profile or uh, a university employer or a funding award associated with a profile. This is a fairly new capability in the ORCID system and very few sites are actually set up to do this yet. So it exceeds uh, upfront on that. And we did have a poster and a paper presented at PERC-19 about the integration of these systems. A nice thing about this is because of the way this works with XRAS, any XRAS client would also have uh, this feature available to them. For the rest of Exceed, um, we have a couple of big ticket items that we're focusing on. Obviously, job one again, managing the allocations process. That never stops um, one, from one quarter to the next, a couple hundred more uh, research requests. Um, but we're changing our major focus to the redesign and replacement of the aging accounting infrastructure. So this is critical to the success of the allocations process. It's important to the service providers helping manage this access to the resources, but elements of the database, the Amy system, and which is the account management information exchange protocol, the other elements of the accounting system date back literally 20 years to the NSF PACI program, which uh, was the one before TerraGrid. If you're familiar with TerraGrid, then there, the program before that was PACI, and that's how old some of those, these components are. So what we're trying to end exceed with an improved accounting system in place. We want simplified integration and operation for service providers, a more robust, flexible, and scalable future for the NSF ecosystem, expanded capabilities that reflect the platform diversity of today and beyond exceed, and just leveraging modern software uh, technologies that just simply didn't exist 20 years ago. And um, what we've been working on this past year will continue also improving XRAS features for submitters, reviewers, and admins. And that's uh, the quick rundown of what RAS does. So I'll take questions if there are any. If not. Okay, thanks so much, Dave. Yep. Okay, and last up today, but of course not least, we have Ron, who is going to talk to us about the program office. Maybe. We're not hearing you, Ron. Which screen are you seeing? There, I can see your screen, but I couldn't hear you talking. So you um, my... I'm seeing the, the slides, so you could just okay. click present. And you're set. It looks good. Okay. 
All right, thank you very much. Uh, my name is uh, Ron Payne, and I'm the, the Program Office Director and the Program Manager for Exceed. So I'll go through with you the, the Program Office and, um, and how we operate and what we do. So our mission is to ensure from a, that all of the critical project level functions are in place and operating effectively and efficient, efficiently. So we are really focused at a project level, and you can see that from the, um, from the uh, organization that we have here. So we got the project office um, and external relations. I'm gonna go through what each of these do, um, but the, you can see how these are the reporting structure for how these uh, report in, and then the associated staffing and, and budgetary numbers. So to go through each of these five areas, the project office really provides oversight for, um, for the project level activities such as quarterly meetings, XAB, so this, this type of meeting and on all of the XAB calls and face-to-face -face that we have, the um, NSF project review that we have on, a, on an annual basis. Those are the types of, of, uh, of activities that the project office organizes and facilitates. Um, and then the external relations team, the ER team, um, they use, uh, they focus on the communications. So they are communicating to both internal and external stakeholders on uh, the value and importance of the seat. So there are, as an example, there are two uh, newsletters. There's a, a newsletter that goes to the staff that's inside Exceed. And then uh, there's an uh, external Exceed, uh, Discover More with Exceed uh, newsletter that goes out. And the ER team is, is the team that, that uh, pulls that together. The, the ER team is also where we have science writers. Um, we we uh, create many of the, the stories uh, that you see come out of Exceed, uh, as well as uh, conference uh, participation at PERC. And at Supercomputing, there's an Exceed booth, and the ER team manages plans and manages that booth and the activities for those uh, for those conferences. The Project Management, Reporting, and Risk Management team. This is our our uh, the PM and R team, and uh, they provide uh, consistent approaches, uh, project management approaches for managing the project. So we have some consistency across. We have, these are things like risk management, change management, those types of project management, uh, standard project management uh, activities are led by this PM&R team. So all of the project managers report in to the PM&R team, um, and then they spend some of their time focused specifically on an L2 area so each of the L2 areas has at least one project manager, but then they also spend time within this group, within the PM&R group, um, taking a look at um, how we can um, make improvements and, and, manage, and managing the project. Uh, and that includes the, the quarterly reports and the annual report that's due to NSF. They're, they are the, the lead for that. They pull that together. The business operations team is the finance team. So that this, this is the team that manages. We have, there are 19 partners, um, Illinois being the, the primary, that means we have 18 subawards. So all of the subawards are managed through the business operations team, as well as all the invoice processing is managed through the business operations team. Um, and then we are, we're gearing up and starting um, some quarterly reports that we'll be providing in PY9 and 10 that will provide financial analysis that go up above and beyond just the transactional, um, the transactional activities. Then lastly, we have the, the strategic planning policy and evaluation uh, team. That's the, the SP&E team. So this, this team has really two purposes. We have a strategic planning el element of this, and this is to make sure that are we, are we aligned with our goals? Are the, the strategic goals that John went through with you and you've heard a few times through the L2 descriptions, um, are these strategic goals the correct strategic goals that we should be going after? Do we need to adjust them at all? Um, so, and we also do um, 
look at stakeholder alignment. Are we, um, how does it look from our stakeholders uh, perspective, not just the users or the service providers, but in general outside uh, those groups, uh, including folks outside those groups. So that's the strategic planning side. The evaluation side is a, a much more um, structured and straightforward or organization. Um, they do uh, an incredible amount of work, evaluation work, where they, they do evaluation internally. So they'll do what's referred to as a climate, a staff climate study. And that's an internal exceed um, where there, there's a survey and analysis done of the results for the internal survey. But then there's also the, the user survey that goes out for exceed users as well as um, some of the Exceed sponsored projects. Uh, for example, the, uh, the PERC conference and the International HPC Summer School that uh, Exceed is in uh, and works with Compute Canada and RIST and PRACE on. Um, the, evalu the Exceed evaluation team provides the evaluation services for those, for those activities, um, as well as other um, Acti evaluation activities within the Exceed project at an L2 or L3 level. So as an example, you heard about Campus Champions. There, the, there was a request from the Campus Champions team within CEE to do an evaluation um, and to check and see how we're doing on the uh, Campus champion side, kind of like a staff climate, but more specifically for the uh, for the campus champions and the evaluation team perform that. So those are the types of activities that the evaluation team works on. Um, these are the, the KPIs that the program office has specifically for the L2 level. There are nine of them and you can see that they're spread across two goals and three sub goals. Uh, and you'll be able to see that, uh, you'll be able to see there that what the, the PY9 targets are just to give you an idea of what we're shooting for uh, for this upcoming year as far as these, these measurements go. So I won't spend a lot of time going through each of these. You'll be able to, it, it should be pretty, pretty straightforward as far as media hits and social media. That's more of an ER type of thing. And there's other, you can, you'll be able to see other things like business uh, operations and, and PM&R and things like that. And then uh, lastly, the, the priorities for PY9. So the, for the project office, it's primarily continue to make sure that the governance and management of the project as uh, overall is, is happening and um, specifically making sure that uh, we co coordinate with the uh, XAB um, team so that we have our six meetings and, and, um, and make sure that if you have everything that you need that the XAB members have everything that, that you need in order to, um, to provide the input that we, we um, are looking for and put a great deal of value on. The um, external relations team, we, uh, are, Hannah uh, Rimmer is, um, is actually, um, has left NCSA or is leaving and changing careers. So uh, we are in the process of identifying and ramping up a new manager. So in PY9, we'll be looking at um, getting a new L3 manager on board for the external relations team. But in, uh, while, that, while we're doing that, we're in general, we, we seek to extend the reach and the communications for all of Exceed services and the impacts that we have. Um, that includes the science stories, um, getting the information available on the, the website, um, having all of the information available for the, the conferences and, and things like that. On the project management reporting side, um, we, we will, uh, can, they're continuing to, to uh, lead and manage the change management and the annual planning process, as well as the, the reports that, that occur. Um, we, for the past couple years, and we will continue to do this, we're, we're moving a lot of our processes over to JIRA because it, it uh, helps us to become more efficient. So um, there are a couple processes that we've got identified that will be moving over to JIRA to make it more automated. And then we recently hired two new project managers, um, specifically here at NCSA, that are ramping up and um, will be a part of the PM&R team. 
On the business operations side, um, continue to, to process the event, the invoices and amendments that we have um, and make that as, as, do that as quickly as we can. Uh, and then, as I mentioned before, we, in PY9, we're starting this uh, quarterly financial reports where we do a lot of um, analysis and, uh, and forecasting that we haven't, um, that, that's been done sparingly in the past, but we're gonna start, begin to do that on a quarterly basis. On the strategic planning and evaluation side, we have the standard evaluation suite, which in, includes um, the exceed components and also includes uh, the PERC conference and the International HPC Summer School. Um, in the XCI, you, you, uh, there was mention to ROI analysis. Um, there's, uh, the evaluation team is, is very involved in that return on investment analysis and will continue to be. Uh, as well as we're looking to, to start up some longitudinal studies that we've, rever that we've reviewed um, with the XAB in the past, as well as the uh, NSF panel during our June panel review, and, and that got uh, positive responses. So we've prioritized, we've got eight different tests that are, or, sorry, eight different studies that have been identified. identified. We have prioritized those and um, we're working on how we can uh, secure funding for all eight of those, but we've begun working on um, at least two of them. So that is the, those are the, the PY9 priorities and that's what I have for the program office. Questions? Okay, thanks, Ron. So that leaves us with six minutes somehow, which is amazing. John, you get six minutes back. Outstanding. How do we do? <laughs> <clears throat> okay, so there was a lot there. I realize that this is a little bit dry for people, <laughs> especially um, on a Friday afternoon when you're probably wanting to get outside or something like that. Um, I appreciate everyone listening, and so I'd, I'd like to just back up a little bit. Are there are there any questions about anything that's been presented here? Are there areas that you'd like to hear more about? We certainly can can arrange to, to discuss more uh, more of it. Um, are there any comments or suggestions that you have with respect to what you've heard? So sort of open open mic, if you will. Um, I don't have any questions at this time. Are, are you overwhelmed? <laughs> I learned a lot of acronyms today. Yes, <laughs> that's, that's one of the challenges. Um, <laughs> It's sad enough that we have a several page uh, appendix in our reports that is definition of acronyms. Right. Don't test me on them now. I need to study up on them first. <laughs> okay. uh, Elizabeth or, or Peter, do you all uh, have any questions at this point? I, I don't. I agree. This is a lot to digest, but it's very helpful. I appreciate it. Um, I, I may have some questions as we get into the, the process more, but this was, uh, I really appreciate these things. All right. Yeah, I, I tend to agree. It's uh, hard to have particular questions now. I think just as we wait and see kind of how we're, how we're involved, then we'll probably have more questions along the way. But it's helpful to have this, this nice overview of everything. Well, I, I'm, I'm glad it sounds like you found it useful because I, I know it's, it's mostly just an input stream running constantly for a couple of hours. Um, and that can be challenging. But I, I appreciate your, uh, your resilience and being able to, to handle that all coming in at once. Um, we, we do have, don't we have a, an XAB uh, call coming up, Leslie? And next Sorry, week. I was muted. Next week. Um, yeah, next Wednesday. Next yeah. Wednesday, okay. So we'll get into sort of the normal, what we normally do in those calls, but we don't, in those calls, we don't really have time to do this, to introduce you to the project. And, and so I hope it, it sort of answers a lot of the, the questions that, you know, in our future discussions, we'll go, well, what do you mean by that? Or I didn't know you were doing that or That'll still happen to some degree, but but hopefully we've 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 covered a lot of that at this point. Um, if there aren't any other questions, I will thank everyone again, and also the Exceed team for for pulling the presentations together and and, and providing them. Um, I, I hope that everyone found this useful. All right, then uh, we will uh, we will be speaking next week. Then, thank you Great, very much. Thank you. Thank Thanks you. everyone. Thanks everyone.